Hi, Jason. Good morning, and thank you all for joining Delaware's Resilient and Sustainable Communities League, or RASCAL, for our fifth annual summit. Our theme this year is Go for the Green, funding and designing resilient infrastructure, and we're all aware of the importance of that funding. So today's going to be full of new ideas, advice, and motivation to really get going for that green. My name is Nicole Marks, and I'm a NOAA Coastal Management Fellow placed at the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control in the Division of Climate, Coastal, and Energy. Energy, which is a founding member of RASCAL. I'm also a member of the RASCAL Outreach and Events Committee. I'm honored to host this virtual summit and want to thank the RASCAL Steering Committee and our Outreach and Events Committee for all their hard work and for hosting such an exciting list of panelists. For those of you that aren't familiar with RASCAL, we're a collaborative network whose mission is to support all Delaware communities in taking the necessary actions to thrive in the face of changing environmental conditions through collaboration, information sharing, and technical assistance. RASCAL has been working actively to meet its mission by establishing four new committees in addition to the pre-existing steering and outreach and events committees in order to accomplish the goals and objectives presented in the 2021 to 2025 strategic plan. These committees include the Community Assistance Committee, the Hazards and Preparedness Committee, the Science and Research Liaison Committee, and the Resilient Project Implementation Committee. It's important to note some recent endeavors by these committees. So for those who are interested, the Resilient Project Implementation Committee recently lodged the Project Guidance Group, which is a new service being offered to Delaware communities needing technical assistance and advice to initiate or complete resilience-related projects. This group offers advisory and technical assistance from RASCO-affiliated experts. And the deadline for this round of applications is December 15th, so just coming up next week. For more information and to apply, please visit the website on the screen and in the chat box. We're also excited to announce we're currently discussing an upcoming Rascal Coffee Hour with Denrex Climate Action Plan team. The date of that coffee hour has not been finalized, but details will hopefully be forthcoming. We will also be holding our Rascal members winter meeting in the winter of 2022. Stay tuned for official announcements soon. Before we get into the session, I'd like to take a moment for technology and housekeeping to keep things going smoothly. During the session, we have moderators designated in the chat box. So if you have questions for the presenters at any time throughout the presentations today, we ask that you use the chat box and then send them to our questions moderator. For help with technical issues, you can chat directly with our technical support moderator. Helping to make today's event possible are our sponsors. At the bronze level, Rascal would like to thank the Delaware chapter of the American Planning Association, the Nature Conservancy, AECOM, and the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center, as well as the professional architects and engineers at GB, GMB. We couldn't hold this summit without our sponsors, so thank you so much. We're very excited that over 190 people have registered for the 2021 Rascal Summit. And as you can see, we have a lot of folks joining us today from different sectors. Specifically, we have a ton of representation from state, county, and local governments, as well as universities, the private sector, and general members of the public. This morning's session is the second of three summit webinars, and it's titled Innovative, The Innovative Funding Panel. We'll have several presentations, followed by a moderated question and answer session. We'll conclude this webinar at 12 o'clock p.m. As you can see, the third webinar in our series will be held this afternoon, starting at 3 o'clock p.m. Please remember to use the Zoom link provided for that session as it's different than the link for this session. A few more things to note before I introduce our moderator. Professional PE and AICP credits are available for each of our webinars. 
A reminder that today's live presentations will be recorded and made available on our website, along with the presentation slides. And we'll follow up with each of you to share resources referenced during the summit, contact information for speakers and attendees, and the all important feedback survey so you can tell us how we can improve next year. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session. Kate Huddlemeyer is a senior engagement manager for the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary, which is a nonprofit which connects people, science, and nature for the Delaware River and Estuary. Kate is on several rascal committees, including the Steering Committee, the Outreach and Events Committee, and the Community Planning Assistance Committee. Kate, the panel is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Nicole said, my name is Kate Huddlemeyer. I'm with the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary. And uh, in my role, I work with colleagues from across the tri-state region to facilitate, support, and spearhead collaborative initiatives that support clean water, healthy habitats, and strong communities. Um, one of those premier collaboratives is RASCAL, um, and obviously it has the best acronym, um, which I just, I can't not plug the RASCAL acronym. It, it makes me so happy. Um, but yes, I'm so pleased to be with you this morning. We've got a really incredible lineup of speakers who will be sharing their experiences and insights into innovative non-traditional funding sources. Um, with us today is Ashley Allen Jones, the founder and CEO of I2 Capital. Jason Lee, the Associate Director at Quantified Ventures, and Brian Lennon, Assistant Water Division Director for the City of Wilmington. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll hold off on responding to questions until the end of all presentations, but please don't hesitate to enter them into the chat feature as they come to you, um, as Nicole had mentioned. So um, in keeping with yesterday's session, uh, as a little icebreaker exercise, and because I'm apparently hungrier than I realized, um, I'll be asking each panelist to share the winter holiday treat that they are most craving or most looking forward to this season. Um, and so with that, we're gonna kick things off and it is my pleasure to introduce Ashley Allen Jones, the founder and CEO of I2 Capital. Um, Ms. Allen Jones is a business and investment executive leading environmental finance innovation across the water, energy and agricultural sectors. She specializes in bridging the gap between public, private, and philanthropic approaches to conservation with the distinct goal of dramatically expanding sustained funding for conservation. Ms. Allen Jones is a dynamic finance professional with expertise across private equity, venture capital, and investment banking, and has a proven track record of working at the dynamic intersection of finance and social change. Um, and so, Ashley, I will turn it over to you, and don't forget to share the winter holiday food you're craving most. Excellent. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm Ashley Allen Jones and winter holiday treat. This may be indicative of, of what I heard yesterday, which is everyone is hoping actually for some really good time off. I'm actually really looking forward to some pe hot peppermint tea at any time of the day. <laughs> Not on Zoom. So um, that, yeah, I'm, I'm going for relaxation. Uh, so let me just jump right in here. I am, let's see, um, hold on. I need to get my, okay, there we go. I'm trying to page down and it wasn't working. <laughs> So as Kate said, I am um, um, CEO of I2 Capital, and we are, our, our real lens on this world is, is a, a finance and capital lens. We, we come from private finance, uh, private equity, investment banking, venture capital, and it has been the, the most extraordinary experience to port the, the professional experience that I had for the first 20 years of my career into this really dynamic ecosystem of conservation and conservation funding. And I joined the sessions yesterday and I really enjoyed learning. Every time I listen to these presentations, I learn about things that I didn't know about. <laughs> and hearing you know, Rachel at NIFWIF and Kate at FEMA and Mike at DELDOT talk about their programs and their approaches. It, I, I, it's always really helpful. And I think having the cross pollinization and different experiences at the table is a, a really exciting part of, of what I and many others in the conservation finance field um, do. So 
uh, I would would add just as as more introduction that uh, over the last six seven years I've I've learned a couple critical things in terms of of definitions and I wanted to share them just as a as a table setter uh, from a from a venture capital lens if if I talk about growth capital. What I'm actually talking about is what a public funder or a grant funder might call capacity support or technical assistance. Took me a while to figure that out. Oh, that's what we're talking about is that gap up front. And from a VC lens, when we talk about uh, an investment, what, what we typically mean is s s some allocation of assets that are gonna return a lot of capital, right? A 10 times return on your capital is what a venture capitalist would look for over a five to seven year period, really aggressive investment return parameters. Um, what I've learned is in the public and grant and philanthropic sector, when, when the word investment in, is used, it can mean all sorts of things, but it, it can mean equity, it can mean debt, it can mean a grant, it can mean a loan, it can mean a lot of different things. So I've, I've had to learn to broaden my, my perspective on that. And um, and so let me just dive in and do a little bit more definition to, to help set the stage for what we're doing. When, when I got involved in this sector seven, eight years ago, what I saw was uh, a conservation funding construct that's largely a paper practice system. So, and, and a lot of money and a lot of unbelievable work going on. So, uh, in many exciting ways, especially today after, after some of the recent big announcements. But fundamentally, we have a paper practice system where funding gets uh, sent out through, through often grant vehicles, sometimes loan vehicles, you know, low interest loan vehicles, but often grant vehicles that goes out for capacity planning and pro, you know, project development, pro, engineering design, et cetera, as one chunk of capital. And then once that work gets done and there's a project that's shovel ready, then there's another chunk of capital that will come in to do the project implementation. And then over time, a, a project will be delivered. I know I'm simplifying dramatically for all the engineers on the, on the call today, but suffice it to say at a very high level, that's the way that I viewed uh, the, the capital running through the conservation system writ large. And, while that's a system that works and will continue to work in many, many cases, there are some challenges with that system. And it can create, um, a, as it says, traditional conservation funding systems can create constraints around velocity, around scale, around scope. And what I've particularly seen is constraints up in the front end of projects coming together. So, um, in when I first got started in the field, I talked to Jason Weller at NRCS, who was heading NRCS at the time, and he said, I can't get my NRCS funding out onto the ground. I can, we only touch 15% of the private property in this country. And then I talked to Jim Gephardt at the EPA Finance Center, and Jim said, we aren't using our SRF funding mechanisms creatively. There's so much more that we could do with SRF. And I talked to ag consultants and conservation professionals and engineers, and they're like, we don't have the business development capacity. We can't, it's too high risk to do all the work that needs to be done in order for us to get a contract to then deliver a service. And so I really saw that there were risks and gaps all over the place. And I thought, well, how might we creatively structure a finance system solution that would address some of those gaps? And so what we have created in our work um, from a model perspective, is a um, it's a revolving fund construct. It's um, a, a nonprofit blended fund, and I'll talk about what that means. So, from a process perspective, what we're doing is 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 turning the source we're creating a source of capital at the front end that takes a material amount of risk off the table for the for this whole process to proceed. So it kind of turns things on its head. We're not necessarily replacing the capital with a new billion dollar pot that's just going to be sent out angelically to 
um, solve, solve all of our conservation practices. So this is not sort of a new venture pool that goes into conservation per se. There are some of those out there. They largely invest in technology-based businesses that will give them the venture returns that they need. So this is about trying to align capital around the types of work that the people on this phone are doing. They're really hard. It's really hard work to do the sustainability work, the resilience work, the, the agricultural conservation work. And so what we've done is we've created a pool of capital that's up front, that's a blended capital, capital pool that is capitalized with grants and loans. So combination of different types of capital. That capital can then be deployed in partnership with nonprofit organizations, engineering firms, consultants, et cetera, to do that 20 to 25% upfront work that's required to get a project, project ready. Then we add a quantification um, measure uh, on top of that so that we are able to say, if we do this project, we believe that we will get these conservation outcomes. Uh, and you know, it's, at some level that's done already, uh, but we are doing it in a way that is a bit more market-based than perhaps is traditionally done. Um, so it's, it's not just scoping and budgeting a project, it's actually running pretty sophisticated models around how we believe the practices that are being implemented will generate pollution reductions. Um, at the end of that process, we have still a go, no go decision, um, but nobody's had to risk or, or the investors in the upfront fund have taken the risk of that whole 25% say of the distribution. And, and then when we get to project implementation, we're able to make a much more simple go, no go decision on whether you then release a, a massive amount of, of capital to do a project. So. Then the trick is there's actually a market-based purchase paper performance contract at the end where the beneficiary of the conservation would pay back that entire that in, entire um, capital pool or at least some of the capital pool. The reason it's not a venture capital fund is that we're not expecting that the capital pool will be paid back $10 on the dollar. I'm hoping that the capital pool might be paid back a dollar for a dollar or maybe even 50 cents for the dollar um, so that we can actually start to have some sustainability and some velocity in, in the cycle of funding. And so pay for performance contracts are you know, fundamentally a municipality, a water purveyor, um, a corporate, a, somebody who is interested in an enterprise that is interested in, in reducing pollution for either regulatory or voluntary reasons enters into a contract and purchases the outcomes of this cycle. So it really just turns the whole process on its head. And it's, and it's pretty exciting. So I'm gonna now run quickly through a, the specific example that we've done in the Brandywine Christina Water Fund, which is um, the Brandywine Christina Revolving Water Fund. So it's in Delaware and Pennsylvania up in the, the watershed, um, probably above where most of you are sitting today. Um, but, but um, we have done an agricultural BMP based solution using this construct. And one of the reasons that we've done that is that you all pr probably have seen a graph like this uh, in the past, but as, as a category, investment in, in green infrastructure, agricultural BMPs can be a very cost effective way to reduce pollutants. That does not mean it's a panacea, right? You're not going to replace gray infrastructure with green infrastructure, but it can be a way to achieve pollution reductions economically and particularly in rural environments to meet a lot of objectives at the same time. And so we focus on agricultural BMPs. What does that mean? This is not rocket science, but it is hard work, right? It's going out onto farms, out into rural communities, looking at where the agricultural runoff, which is a huge portion of the pollution challenge, in much of at least up, you know, northern Delaware, um, and it's all across the state. Actually, all across the tri-state area, it's a, it's it's a challenge, right? It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's urban urban runoff and ag runoff are big big challenges, and they're only going to get more challenging. And so we're talking about basic um, 
constructs that are put on onto farms, whether they're grass waterways, wetlands, riparian buffers, windbreaks, filter strips. There's a lot of expertise around putting these practices in. There's actually a lot of capital available to, for the practices, but the systems are clunky. So we put these systems, we, we put these practices into the ground, we quantify the projected outcomes from the practices. And then in the case of the Brandywine Christina Revolving Water Fund, we've, we've worked very closely with uh, both PADEP and DENREC to align the quantification methodologies and the, um, the, the sort of reporting and contracting to align that with the guidance, with the very explicit guidance and goals of the regulators and, and the permits, the things that are required for municipalities or other entities to meet their permit requirements. And so then we have a contracting um, mechanism and we've piloted and tested actually closed three different transactions using this methodology with one with the, Canada, the, the township of Kennett, Kennett Township, one with East Marlboro and one with the city of Newark. Um, and those collectively had about a half million dollar cumulative valley, a cumulative, cumulative value. So we're in a really exciting place. Um, this is just the example of Eden Ratliff, who's the township manager in Kennett Township. I also wanted to point out, particularly since AECOM is a sponsor, um, we worked really closely with Dave Athey, who is an engineer at AECOM, who helped the city and us and the regulators to sort of, you know, we all work together around the same table to align to align the approach and align the outcomes. And, and it was a win-win-win. Every, everybody came out of this, um, I think, satisfied with the outcome. Um, right now, what we're doing, since we've closed these three pilots, we are actually in the market uh, doing some more uh, uh, sort of analytical work in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and its Global Water Funds team and a firm called Pegasus out of South Africa and, um, uh, Austra actually, it's out of Australia and London, not, not South Africa. But we're, we're doing a lot more work to get more granular on which agricultural BMP options we should be using, what precisely the urban areas are that are within a regulatory purview. Um, if we're talking to a water utility, precisely where their intake points are and what that would mean in terms of, you know, putting in practices and reducing the pollutants coming into their intake and ultimately trying to create a strong business case around the investment, around the funding, or around the refund, actually. It's a business case around the refund of this whole process and why they would, why they would be motivated to um, part with capital. <clears throat> and we're also doing geospatial, you know, sophisticated technology stuff, right? With a lot of people that are very good at technology to understand precisely the characteristics of the watershed. So um, where we are today, we, again, have capitalized this, this fund. We've got some great uh, funders that are really some of the leading freshwater funders in the country, William Penn Foundation, Longwood Foundation, um, NIFWIF, Agua Fund. Uh, and we put together this blended conservation fund and we are working on rolling out this model more broadly, um, talking to public sector beneficiaries, uh, be they MS4s, be they purchase pools out of USDA, um, or be they corporates that are interested in, in funding either water or in some cases carbon reductions. Um, we've got this going in four different sub watersheds now across the Delaware and the, and the Chesapeake Bay. And it's, it's, it's exciting. And it's, I, I think that I, I hope that there is a lot of enthusiasm for this again, not as a panacea, not as a replacement to how we're doing business, but as a potential interesting innovative addition. Uh, and there's, there's applicability you know, everywhere that we have an intersect of agricultural, urban runoff and water quality, which is at least the Eastern half of the United States. We can into water, water scarcity issues on the Western side, but on the Eastern side, and there are different models for that, but on the Eastern side, there's, there's 
huge replicability. So um, you can see more about the revolving water fund. I'd love to take questions, answers, et cetera. I hope I didn't go too long. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ashley. That was wonderful um, to keep us moving. Um, next up, I am very pleased to introduce Jason Lee. Uh, Jason is the Associate Director at Quantified Ventures, where he works to develop outcome-based financing models that enable faster, more efficient compliance with existing regulations. His work has included leading the creation of environmental impact bonds to implement water infrastructure pilot projects in Hampton, Virginia, Memphis, Tennessee, and Boise, Idaho, the development of market-based groundwater management programs in Texas, and the design of financing strategies to accelerate salmon restoration on the Oregon coast. He's a graduate of Duke University's Trinity College and the Nicholas School, where he studied economics, policy, and water finance. Jason, thank you for being here this morning. And uh, I'll turn it over to you and your favorite winter holiday treat. Thanks, Kate. Um, before I get into that, um, Ashley, Callan, and, and the rest of the IT team, it's, it's been really cool to listen to how your work has evolved um, over the, the past couple of years. So um, congratulations on all your progress. Um, super, super cool. Um, I'm hoping that y'all can see my screen OK. Yep, we can. Is that cool. Um, yeah, so my favorite uh, winter holiday treat, I've got to say right now, it's the pecan pie. Um, I associated a lot with, um, you know, being with my family and having pecan pie over Thanksgiving or or the or over Christmas uh, Christmas dinner. So um, haven't seen my family a lot over the pandemic and uh, just really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about environmental impact bonds uh, today. I think the really cool thing about being a part of this environmental finance community is um, all the different types of innovations that are going on. Uh, the, the work that Ashley just talked about with I2 Capital um, tries to bring in new funding, an additional tool in the toolkit, uh, a different tact for how municipalities and, and other uh, agencies are, are doing this nature-based work. Um, the Environmental Impact Fund uh, piggybacks on a lot of the great stuff that municipalities are already doing. Um, and so uh, a different sort of uh, arrow in the quiver, if you will. Before I get into what the EIB is, I just want to spend a, a brief minute or two on uh, our company, Quantified Ventures. Um, we work in the impact investing space uh, across three different uh, offerings. Uh, consulting, you know, advising on, you know, what are the different types of funding and financing solutions and you know, we can call that more the peer consulting bucket. Uh, developing the, the projects and partnerships that would pair with those funding and financing strategies. So maybe how do you get your particular project or program into a, a place where it can actually receive innovative funding or financing? And then finally, uh, the structuring actually of those transactions. So, um, you know, maybe once that consulting and you know advisory work is done, and we feel like there is a thesis there. Uh, once those projects and partnerships have been developed to a point where they're ready to receive innovative funding or financing, um, and the structuring bucket is is going out and helping you raise that capital, or um, and then in in a lot of cases deploying that capital. And so we are a, a B Corp, uh, but we're also a for-profit company, and and I think those two pair really well in that the B Corp helps us. Uh, hold us accountable to be mission driven and impact focused, both in terms of externally our work, but also internally with our practices and our um, our operations. Um, and then the for profit uh, is, uh, you know, we're we're held accountable to, um, you know, making sure our our solutions are sustainable and they're that they're scalable. And ultimately, what we want to do is uh, make sure that the solutions that get pushed forward and um, are addressed through financing um, are sustainable, are the best fit for that financing lens. Um, there are definitely environmental solutions or aspects of environmental challenges that are better addressed through the more traditional routes of uh, you know, philanthropy or regulation or, or policy or, or budget, um, volunteering, culture change. Um, and we're, we're trying to identify the, the tools and the use cases that can uh, support innovation along that financing front. Before I get into what an environmental impact fund is, I just want to level set of what a what a municipal bond is. And, and again, uh, the the environmental impact bond structure 
piggybacks off of this bond structure. It doesn't necessarily have to be a municipal bond. Um, it could be a corporate bond. And you know, we've worked on or consulted on a couple of those deals. Um, but historically, a lot of a lot of the folks that we've worked with have been in the municipal bond context. So just to level set, um, it can seem a lot more complicated than it is uh, at the end of the day. It's, uh, a lot of uh, the terms are, are, are maybe a little bit different, but the concept should be pretty similar. Works a lot like any other debt structure, you know, mortgage, car loan, student loans, whatever, where, you know, the issuer, in this case, the municipality is the person taking out the loan, right? And the investors would be the lender and the proceeds is, is the upfront amount of the loan that you're getting. And so the issuer, when they go out and issue a bond, it's, um, you know, like a 300 page document laying out, you know, here are the terms of the loan. Here's our financial statements. Here's all the, you know, the legal um, mumbo jumbo. That's just way over my head, but essentially taking out that loan and promising to pay interest payments on a certain schedule. And that's all laid out in that 300 page document that's called the official statement. And when a municipality goes out and gets that loan, they're doing it for you know, purposes that are beneficial to the public, right? Schools, um, water treatment facilities, uh, new municipal buildings, library, you know, what have you. And so those funded public projects, the whole point of those is to generate positive outcomes for the community, whether that be you know, better education, better health, cleaner environment, um, you know, nicer place to live. And um, the, the typically how this works, and this goes to something that Ashley talked about earlier, the actual outcomes of those funded projects, the, the projects where the, the municipality took out the loan to build the thing doesn't often get measured, right? It, it's left at the level of, we believe that this will do good for the community and you know, that's sort of it. And so the financing, is decoupled from the actual outcomes, which is fine, you know, and that's the way it's worked for, for hundreds of years that municipal bonds and, and public financing has existed in society. Um, but we think there's an opportunity for improvement and, and particularly with this focus on outcomes and quantifying the outcomes in a really rigorous, um, you know, a quantifiable and transparent way, it can answer three key questions. And the first is, how wisely were those public dollars spent? So if you were to go out and, you know, issue a bond as a municipality for, uh, you know, a new uh, detention basin or, or water treatment facility or, um, you know, green infrastructure park, you know, how efficient is that? How many, what's the dollars per stormwater capture or dollars per pound of nitrogen reduction? You know, what is that efficiency? And, and typically that, you know, A, that performance efficiency doesn't get measured. And B, if it was, it that feedback loop doesn't make it back to uh, finance and sometimes not even to the executive decision-making level. It's, it's, if it's measured, it's, it's kept within that kind of um, you know, engineering public workspace. And so that adaptive management or feedback loop of finance to say, hey, actually, we're get like what is the optimal portfolio between gray and green you know let's let's pick that sweet you know to to ashley's graph of that efficiency curve where are the efficiency curves for our locality for our municipality and that data-driven decision making doesn't always happen uh the second thing is uh there's an increasing uh really exploding bucket of of these investors that care about those uh, environmental and, and social outcomes. And so ESG here standing for environmental, social, and governance, that kind of responsible investing bucket. Um, there's, a, there's a lost opportunity, um, and, and in a lot of cases, money left on the table for investors who want to put dollars towards uh, projects that do beneficial good, and they want to see proof of that. And then finally, third is in the transparency um, realm of being able to tell your, your rate payers who are ultimately helping to repay that bond through their tax dollars, here's what your tax dollars have achieved for you and for the community in really quantitative terms. Um, so the environmental impact bond addresses all, all of those questions and um, you know, does that by being a, a label given to a bond. So when a, when a municipality issues the bond, they are able to say this is an environmental impact bond when that bond does three things. One is it gives a quantitative prediction of what those outcomes will be for the community, whether that's you know gallons of, of 
flood mitigation or gallons of you know reduced aquifer withdrawal or pounds of nitrogen um what what are what do we think this 12 million dollars of debt is going to get us as the, for the community uh, the second thing is after that project is built going back and measuring the performance so where do we think where did we think it was going to land you know that's number one and then two where did it actually land and then three is the important bit of course of actually reporting out what that that outcome was what that performance was and that's typically done both to the investor who is who has a a, a keen interest in knowing what those outcomes were and being and getting a report and then also to the community of, of what their money got them and so you can think of the label as sort of a like an organic sticker on an avocado right it's like you know an avocado may just be an avocado but there's there's a really significant uh portion of of the consumer uh consumer base that wants to know that this avocado came from a good place you know did all these really great things um you know in in the production of the avocado um and the environmental impact bond as a label um, maybe you could think of it as like a QR code where you could like scan it and it tells you exactly how many gallons of water went into it and, you know, what were the carbon emissions from being shipped over, things like that. And so it's an extra level of transparency and, and quantification that that proves that the the dollars were wisely spent and it's being uh, done for environmental and social reasons. Uh, so then the EIB label, it doesn't take away from any of the financial and legal underpinnings of a normal municipal bond, right? So any issuer that could be a municipal bond, any municipal bond that is doing an environmental and social uh, project can also become an EIB and, and get that, that organic sticker slapped on it. Um, the advantage of this is that by slapping that organic sticker, you're attracting the attention of a really rapidly growing uh, investor base. And, and according to s and Global, the the this is the us alone the municipal esg bond space has grown 50 percent year on year over the past six or seven years it's expected to be over um three uh, 30 billion dollars in 2021 the the and the eib and we've we've had conversations with investors about this um you know they see the environmental impact bond approach as leading the pack um a lot of uh folks have called it the the quote gold standard of the green bond marketplace and it's because of that increased transparency right um for those of you that are familiar with green bonds that is a, a what we call a use of proceeds label meaning uh the investors get to see that as a category this project is good for the environment but there's the the extra level of transparency and accountability of are you measuring it and what are the quantifiable outcomes is uh, almost all of the time missing from a green bond. And so by quantifying, uh, evaluating and disclosing the outcomes, the environmental impact bond actually hits better at what investors are calling for. Uh, and the proof of that has been in the EIBs that we've done, uh, investor bids alone in, in have added up to two times the bond amount, meaning you could doubly fund the green project just from that extra bucket of investors that came to the table. Um, underwriters, the banks that we've worked with have said that the, this increase in demand from ESG investors who are attracted because of that environmental impact on label uh, helped them lower the borrowing cost for the municipality. And so they would have gotten a higher interest rate if it weren't for the EIB label. Um, and so, you know, the bottom line there is that for municipalities that are doing green projects and, and using municipal bonds to fund those projects, not targeting ESG investors amounts to money left on the table. You're paying a higher interest rate. You're getting less money um, for, uh, for that project that you're trying to do. Um, this is a, a getting a, a bit under the hood and into the weeds. Uh, if, for those of you that are um, finance nerds, uh, this slide may mean a lot to you. I'll do my best to, to try to keep it simple. This is a, a comparison of uh, EIBs versus uh, traditional municipal bonds and the green bonds, which some of you may be familiar with. And I'm going to talk about them um, from these five aspects of, you know, do you know whether or not your funded project or do you know how well it did? Two is the transparency. Excuse me. Three is the, the investor base that you're likely to attract. Fourth is the public relations and 
relations and partnership potential. And fifth is the risk mitigation opportunities. And um, from the, the knowledge of the project performance, again, in municipal bonds and, and green bonds, um, traditionally, uh, there is no actual requirement to go back and measure the performance, right? And in EIBs, we require that. Helps you build your evidence base. Um, the outcome metrics that we use are really straightforward. You know, it doesn't require a PhD study. You can do it uh, generally with the engineers that you've already got on staff or on, on a retainer. Uh, and we, we take pains to make sure that's the case. And then also the transparency um, for municipal bonds and green bonds, typically it's just the financial disclosures, which, you know, uh, they it's, it's required, you know, just by, by regulation. Um, in environmental impact bonds, we add in, you know, an extra page or two of, you know, here's the environmental outcomes that have been achieved, right? And that um, seems to make all the difference for investors, right? They're so used to not getting any details about the environmental outcomes that they put their dollars towards that even having a couple pages of, you know, here's the stormwater gallons that were installed, here's the reduction in pollution, um, that's enough for them to come to the table and, and offer really good terms. Uh, the potential investor base, again, the widest possible base comes with EIBs because the leading uh, ESG investors, including some of the largest investors in the world, you know, the Franklin Templetons, the Goldman Sachs's, um, they, they, the JP Morgans, they want uh, that extra level of, of transparency and quantification. Um, the public relations and partnerships, the, the past EIBs that we've done get a national, regional, local, and industry media attention. Um, attention from uh, new investors, uh, peer governments, and actually, um, uh, I think about 50% of our EIBs historically, not to say that there's a promise, but um, have won some kind of industry um, award for innovation and, and um, you know, doing cool stuff. And actually, our, our most recent deal um, as is, is up for nomination uh, for one of those awards as well. Uh, Risk mitigation opportunities, uh, there's a sort of a, um, an inherent advantage to measuring your, your project performance, meaning you know, when you measure how well the project is done, you know whether or not that's the, the smart choice to put in the next $12 million of debt versus like, hey, we actually found out that these solutions over here don't do really great. Let's you know, go back to what we were doing, which we know works, or let's try something different. Um, and then there's another uh, possibility of if you, um, there have been EIBs where investors have been willing to take on an extra bit of performance risk, where if the projects achieve environmental outcomes, then they're, they're willing to incentivize uh, the, the municipality with an additional uh, financial benefit um, as a reward for their performance. Um, so I know I went through a lot, happy to answer questions, um, both here and uh, you know, offline if we run out of time. Here's my contact information. Um, but I, uh, yeah, appreciate your, your attention and, and thanks for letting me talk. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, we will now head to our last, but certainly not least presenter for this session. Um, and that is Brian Lennon, who is the, uh, the Assistant Water Division Director for the uh, City of Wilmington Department of Public Works. Brian holds a Bachelor's of Civil Engineering and a Master of Environmental Engineering from the University of Delaware, go Blue Hens. Uh, he has 23 years of experience in the field of water and wastewater engineering and has worked in both the public and private sector. Um, his, both his education and his work in those sectors have covered a wide range of experience in the practice of water and wastewater engineering, utility management, and environmental compliance. He is currently responsible for the city of Wilmington's teams that manage compliance with the MPDES discharge permits, uh, including the wastewater treatment plan operations, MS4 stormwater program, the CSO long-term control plan, real-time control for CSO storage and capture, and the industrial pretreatment program. Brian, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. And don't forget to tell us what holiday food you're most looking forward to eating. Well, I'll leave my video on shortly well, until I uh, do the presentation and then I'm going to shut my my personal video um, off. Uh, as far as the holiday treat, I'm going to go a, a different direction, more nostalgic. So this is for for all the older people or if, a, if you're in my category, I'll call it just plain old 
uh, people on the call. Um, remembering back to the early 70s when I was a young kid, um, believe it or not, um, we had a service at the house um, where it wasn't that actually delivering milk, you know, like the milkman, but it was actually the Charlie Chip was the was the company. They actually delivered potato chips and pretzels in a steel tin can, you know, like a cookie tin kind of, but a little bit bigger. Um, and we would get that delivery, you know, once every other week or a month, you know, a couple times a month. Um, and during the holidays, they would deliver it my mom would request an order and they would deliver a tin of holiday chocolate covered graham cookies that had you know colored sprinkles on it to kind of represent the holidays and so i remember that was always an exciting time to to get those holiday um cookies at the time and now um i think those are probably just a collector's item the the the, the tins that they used to deliver potato chips in the charlie chip so if anybody local remembers that uh, be curious yeah, put put it in the chat um all right i'm gonna shut down my video here keep my audio on let me know uh if uh um you have any trouble with this and let me see if i can share a screen uh, where did my presentation go um hold on did i i didn't accidentally shut it down did i nope it's there there it is it didn't pop up right away all right um so i cobbled this presentation together from uh, a variety uh about three different um presentations that i had used bef before so hopefully it flows appropriately. Um, and one comment I would add to sort of to give people a little bit of understanding of sort of where I'm coming from as opposed to the other panelists. They're, the other panelists are kind of talking about innovative ways to create these um, potential sources of funds and, and acquire it. I'm, I'm the end user person here on this. I'm the one who signs uh, invoices to the contractor that built those green infrastructure installations or other environmental projects or water sewer projects um, and i sign off on that that check that draws down that money whether it's a a, a bond a state revolving loan fund or grant money you know um, and so it, it gives me a when i think about the amount of invoices i've signed in the past 10 nine years here with the city uh, i need to pop a couple of tums uh, to to kind of help the, with the indigestion on that it's literally tens of millions of dollars in funds um so with the city of wilmington um i'll give you a little bit of perspective on our stormwater um user fee program and some of our other um challenges and issues we have as, as especially as it relates to funding and projects and kind of describe some of the projects uh and sources uh, we've used for some of these funds. Um, just to give you an idea, the city of Wilmington is a city of about 70,000 people, but we have a wastewater treatment plant that serves uh, the area of Delaware north of the CND Canal. Anybody that's on a public sewer system north of the CND Canal, um, most likely it, that flow goes to the Wilmington wastewater treatment plant located on the Delaware River immediately adjacent to the uh, confluence with the Christina River. Um, we are a 130 year old sewer utility um, and as such, like most um, ones, especially on the East Coast, um, we are a CSO community, a combined sewer overflow community, which means that we have a variety of locations in our system where um, the pipes that normally are carrying sanitary sewer flow also are expected to carry stormwater flow. And um, as a result, um, when we have a rainfall event, we have combined sewer overflows to the Brandywine and Christina River and uh, another one on the, on the um, Shell Pot Creek as well. Um, and so we have to manage those overflows and we're under our program, what I'll talk about here a little bit here, a long-term control plan with the, um, that's submitted to uh, DENREC and also to the EPA. And the goal of that program is to manage and minimize the amount of overflows that occur to the rivers of 
during wet weather events and uh, uh, conversely maximize the capture rate, capture as much of the overflow, the storm water, combined storm water and sewer flows during a storm event and send that flow to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so uh, we've had a, a variety of uh, plans with the state, a long-term control plan um, initiated in the 1990s that kind of laid out an initial plan uh, for that, included upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, in 2003, we updated that plan to an enhanced long-term control plan um, with a goal to match the EPA's goal of 85% capture of the CSO volume. Um, and one of the key aspects of you know, any long-term <clears throat> control plan for management of CSO overflows is you want to eliminate dry weather overflow. So in the city of Wilmington, we don't have any CSO overflows going to the river during a normal um, dry weather day. It's only during a wet weather event. Um, and as you can expect, to, in order to accomplish this capture rate, we've had to implement a variety of projects. We built a almost 3 million gallon storage tank in one of our parks um, and uh, that um, at great cost and disruption to the park. So we were looking for um, alternatives to kind of uh, find lower cost ways to um, capture those CSO flows and uh, route them to the wastewater treatment plant. So we implemented a real-time control system in, our, in the city that actually manages the flows in our um, system with a series of monitors and automatically controlled valves and a model that models the flow that's in the system and makes intelligent predictive decisions to um, utilize the storage at the most uh, opportune times to minimize the overflows and maximize the flow that goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And it also utilizes the storage that we have in the large diameter pipes in our system, uh, as opposed to building new expensive tanks in the system. Um, and as a result of choosing to use a innovative higher technology um, system that optimized the capture rate in our pipes in our system that were already built and underground, um, it resulted in uh, approximately $90 million in savings um, over the alternative of building large scale gray infrastructure tanks that store that flow in the system. That's an example of how, you know, and it'd be curious in our discussion how we can talk about how, you know, offsetting costs in alternative ways, how that can be kind of measured as a quantitative outcome that may be, you know, um, something that can um, enhance the, the environmental impact bonds and the other innovative sources of funding. Um, so our, our goals for managing our CSO system is, uh, you know, in our long-term control plan, um, we listed implementing a stormwater utility billing infrastructure, and I'll get into that next. Um, we want to, in addition to you know, capturing that flow and sending it to the plant, we want to reduce the amount of runoff that gets into the system so that we have less runoff to manage in our sewer collection system and, and implementing green infrastructure is a great way to reduce it at the source. So our plan for our CSO management was to get this real-time control system and get us up to 85% capture and then to do incremental improvements by using green infrastructure um, in our system to reduce the source of these flows getting into our system. Um, our, uh, um, one other aspect of our system, just to kind of give you an idea, sort of the challenges we face is that about 90% of our collection system is this combined sewer flow where the pipes that are handle this the sanitary sewer flow or also the pipes that handle storm water. But we also have about 10% of our system that is just storm separated storm water system only. And so we need to manage those flows as well. We are a co-permittee under New Newcastle County and DelDOT um, for the MS4 permit uh, with the state. And so we need to manage and, and maintain the water quality of our discharges through our storm water system as well. So that's an additional cost that we have to manage. Um, so Back in 2006, 2007, the city made the decision to implement a stormwater fee program. And the goals of that were to recover some of these costs that we had that I just listed previously to implement these measures to minimize our overflows to the river and also to enhance our stormwater management in our um, MS4 portion of the system. Um, and 
to do that in a way that was fair to everyone. And to give you an idea of sort of the approach of this, think about a um, parking lot in the city of Wilmington that's in our combined sewer overflow system. Well, previous to the stormwater fee program, that parking lot is collecting stormwater discharging it into the sanitary or combined sewer pipes that hand, handle the sanitary and stormwater flow. And now we have to manage that, take that flow off to the wastewater treatment plant, treat it, um, and do our best to minimize the amount of overflows that are happening as a result of all that impervious runoff coming from that parking lot. So we implemented a stormwater fee program uh, where that parking lot, which previously wasn't contributing at all in any tangible way to the management of our CSO program, um, and applying a fee to that to those users that are contributing stormwater runoff to our system, um, so that we can equitably, you know, distribute the cost across um, our user base. Um, and one of the key aspects of this is, and I encourage everybody to correct anybody on this, if you a properly implemented stormwater fee program in the city of Wilmington, it's a user fee, it's not a tax. Um, everybody wants to say, oh, it's a stormwater tax, but it is actually a fee that gets applied um, to the same bill that they pay their sewer and water bills on in the city of Wilmington. Um, so it's a fee for the use of our collection system and for all the expenditures that we um, uh, incur to manage the water quality in the watershed passing through Wilmington. Um, and the rates are designed to recover those costs. So we have a, a, an account fund in the city of Wilmington that is a stormwater account fund that was created after this that um, tracks the amount of revenue coming in and the amount of money that we're spending just like any other fund on our water, sewer, or general fund with the city. And one interesting aspect of it was that we actually lowered the sewer bills that we were charging to the customers in the city um, to offset the increased cost. So this was revenue neutral. It was meant to balance out and provide equity. So some users like a, a parking lot got a bill that they're paying that they never had before and they weren't very happy about that. And then uh, another user that may have had a, um, a larger parcel with a lot of uh, pervious area that the, and maybe stormwater BMPs to capture it would their bill would get lower. Um, so we actually lowered the bill, the the water recovery factor from 1.4 to 0.7. So um, that represented we were, we're actually charging less to our sewer customers than what their water bill was representing. Um, they used to be. Um, we added a whole bunch of different classes um, to to reflect each of the users that uh, um, are paying into this fund. Um, the residential classes uh, were just kind of a standard, you know, based on your um, residential class in the tax parcel database. And so we um, would take information from Newcastle County um, and depending on the size of your parcel and the class that you're in, you would get applied a, a rate fee for a residential. Um, and if you're a non-residential, um, you got the, uh, um, applied in a pervious area for that based on the tech, Newcastle County tax parcel database. Um, and um, they're charged accordingly based on their equivalent sort of development units of each of those and the amount of impervious area that those um, parcels had. Um, and then one additional benefit of this process is we had a um, quantity and quality credit process and an appeal process so that if you um, have a parcel in which you have stormwater management controls on there, you could apply for a quantity credit. If you're reducing the amount of runoff coming off of your parcel, you can get up to a 50% credit on your stormwater management fee for those uh, BMPs that you've installed on your project. And you can get a quality credit of 10% um, up there for a total of 60% reduction in your stormwater fees for managing that stormwater. So it's designed to also encourage proper, you know, practices by the parcel owners. Um, uh, and when it was initially implied, if you do uh, go through this process, expect to get a wave of appeals and credits. So appeals would be a case of where um, a customer said, you know, was applied that they have a 90% um, impervious area to their parcel, um, according to what the Newcastle County tax parcel database is. And if it was a wooded parcel um, that was undeveloped, and it really should be a 10% runoff factor, they can appeal it 
and we would have somebody go out there, review the impervious area and reduce it down, get the Newcastle County parcel database to reduce their um, uh, run their impervious area factor on that, and then that would uh, lower their their bill. And then they could also apply for the credit if they had any BMPs on there. Or they implemented any BMPs, so we had a quite a wave of those coming in. So if you do implement something like this and have a credit process, expect to get an initial wave of of appeals and credits on there. Um, also, you might get some people challenging it. The Army Corps of Engineers, believe it or not, on their dredge spoil site on the Christina, has challenged the fees that they're being charged. Uh, for this, and we are litigating in court because you, if you have a program like this, you need to defend it. And if you don't defend it, then you may um, open it up to being rendered, you know, null and void. You know, if you're not actually, you know, act actively defending and and uh, uh, representing the rest of the users and the fees they're being charged. Um, Interesting. And one of the minor issues that we had with that or issues was that initially they they uh, implemented a direct discharge permit for any parcels that were immediately along the river, um, that they would get an automatic 10% factor since they weren't discharging into our CSO pipes. We realized that that was going to um, have a significant impact, a $900,000 impact uh, that they were paying essentially $900,000 less or almost a million dollars less than their fair share of charges based on their size and their impervious areas that these parcels that were directly discharging into the river, we came to the conclusion that we are spending money to improve the watershed quality and those customers that are along the river are benefiting from that improvement in watershed quality. So they should share in the cost for it. So we, we eliminated this direct discharge 10% you know, category and reverted them back to be similar to the other users. And that's definitely one of the things that the Army Corps took issue with. Um, but um, we feel that a user along the river is benefiting from the quality of that river and they should be paying their fair share um, for those costs to manage that water quality uh, throughout the city. Um, and I'm gonna skip through that. So, um, and the one of the other key issues you'll have to deal with if you implement a stormwater utility um, is you know exempted property so one of the factors is that um, parks in the city and other city-owned parcels um, initially were considered were they were con being considered for an exemption uh, to the stormwater fees and we decided that that was not an equitable way to distribute those costs so mm -hmm. um, city parcels that are not part of the water sewer utility and even the water sewer utility, any parcel we own gets charged these stormwater fees. And in our accounting system, the funds for those stormwater fees get transferred, say, from the general fund for a large and par pervious parcel that, uh, you know, real estate and housing may own. Um, to the water sewer fund so that our rate payers are not paying for city owned parcels that are contributing to the runoff in the city that we have to manage. And so um, the city made the decision that there would be no exempt parcels for city owned parcels that they would all be charged and that would be handled on the accounting side. Um, uh, quick uh, um, sort of description of some of the projects that you know, having these funds enable us to do. If uh, any of you guys recognize my name on the call, it's most likely because of our South Wilmington um, wetland um, project that we are doing in South Wilmington uh, adjacent to the neighborhood of South Bridge. Um, and so I've done multiple presentations on that. And many of you have probably seen those and I'm not gonna go into too much detail on that, but I will say that um, one of the, um, artifacts and you see on this slide here, this is a, we actually did a, about a 15 to 20 acre wetland restoration project that's designed to, to um, store stormwater from the community nearby, treat that stormwater before it's discharged out to the river and um, do a sewer separation project adjacent to this uh, wetland project where we're reducing the amount of stormwater that's going to the wastewater treatment plant or through overflows out to the river and managing that stormwater into this newly created wetland. Um, and um, this slide uh, that was in the in my wetland 
um, presentation that I gave to uh, uh, what the American Water Resources Association for Delaware shows all the variety of complex uh, um, components of this project. Um, you know, it, it was just a very complex project. We're about halfway through it. We haven't got to the sewer separation portion, but it includes, you know, defining the problem. What are we trying to solve for the flooding and, and uh, public health issues with the community, the restored wetland that we're trying to, to restore. Um, we have a variety of sources of funding. We have uh, some compliance with a, with a consent decree that's, that's a component of that. We have to do the engineering, the planning, the community outreach, the administration construction. You can see it's, a, it's a quite a complex um, problem uh, or project. Um, one part of the project that uh, is very unique as far as a city project is all the multiple project goals that are included in this project. It reduces flooding, improves water quality, um, restores um, wetlands, cleans up a brownfield. It is a creation of a, um, an environmental um, wetland park in an uh, um, underserved community, and it even reduces mosquito breeding grounds to that community. And what do we get for um, implementing a project with all these multiple goals? We get a project with multiple sources of funding available to us, and that's kind of the the angle I'm taking and bringing this description of this project into the discussion is is that because this project has so many different goals and outcomes uh, as a result of it, it has a lot of different sources of funding available to us, and this is um, I think one, two, three, four, five, six seven, eight, nine different sources of funding that are contributing to this project. So it's a, a pretty complex uh, process to manage all of that. The lion's share of the funding is coming through state revolving loan funds. We got a national fish and wildlife grant. We have city bond money that's contributing to a portion of this. We got a um, grant from the Nature Conservancy to help us with the land acquisition. Um, and we have a unique fund um, that contributed to especially the planning and engineering phase of this work, the State um, Land Conservation Loan Fund, which was associated with the um, SRF funding, but they actually refinanced a, uh, one of our SRF funds to lower the interest rate and create um, additional um, principal available to us to use on this project um, by lowering the interest rate um, increasing the principal on the project. Um, and this was a um, land conservation, or this was a state revolving loan fund that was for a completely separate project at the wastewater treatment plant, our REBF, Renewable Energy Biosolids Facility. So it was a unique way to take another fund or loan, lower the interest rate and apply it to a project that the state determined was a high priority or which was our wetland project and a green uh, environmental project at that. Um, another project I wanted to highlight before I get wrapped up here is um, a project that we're actively underway and we're getting ready to put out uh, the first uh, bid documents hopefully in January on this project at the Urban Artist Exchange at 15th and Walnut Street. Um, and this is some of the slides from a presentation that we gave to the Longwood Foundation um, uh, in relation to that project. And so what we are trying to do here is integrate green infrastructure into an urban arts project site over there. So it's a kind of a unique um, project and part of the the seeds for that idea are projects that we did at two other locations in the city and city park so we have this this system that as you're all aware as i described of having to deal with the stormwater um, management in the same pipes of our as our sanitary sewer pipe so we're trying to reduce the amount of sources of uh, stormwater coming into our system. And in a couple of other projects and other locations that you're seeing in the photos here, we implemented green infrastructure in city parks that takes flow off of the impervious area of the street and manages it in this green infrastructure and reduces the amount of flow that was getting into our CSO system. And the park in, in exchange is getting a very nice rain garden, um, landscape planting and even drainage management in the park. This uh, Cool Springs Park, it had uh, some flooding issues in the playground that we were able to address with this and at the same time, reduce our over uh, contribution of flows to the CSO system. 
So using that same model, we decided to work with the Urban Arts Exchange and implement green infrastructure at the 15th and Walnut City Stables location um, and basically um, implement uh, a variety of types of green infrastructure that you're seeing here, such as the storm tech type units that are buried under the lawn area, um, uh, bioswales and rain gardens uh, with a series of check dams and V-notch releases of, of flow so that we're um, capturing stormwater flow and um, giving it a chance to be uh, managed with the plantings and infiltration into the system um, and designing it to be integrated into this new arts facility that the Urban Arts Exchange is building um, at that location. Um, and we're using our stormwater fee funds to uh, accomplish this. So this is some of the examples of the, the types of insulation, green infrastructure insulations that are going into it. And here's a good um, uh, landscape designer's rendering of what, what you'll see here. So you, we're actually using this green infrastructure to capture stormwater that's coming from offsite from 15th Street that's adjacent to the project area and from two small subdivisions that were constructed in which they separated their stormwater out from the sanitary sewer flow. And we're routing that flow into this site, um, managing it through the bioswales and the check dams and the rain gardens um, and creating nice um, wooden boardwalk over the uh, walk ways over top of our green infrastructure that integrates into the design of the project. And now the community can come enjoy the arts while they're managing stormwater unknowingly as there's these people would literally be standing on top of our storm tech units below that lawn area. And in doing so, we're offsetting the land development, their land you know, redevelopment cost for the urban arts exchange and they can focus their money on the the portions of the project that are more relevant to their um to their goals of providing an open space for for art on the site so there will be a you know when you go there um hopefully in a year or so from now you'll be able to go attend a concert at the amphitheater over there um see uh, displays in the stables of uh artists uh, uh um, displaying their wares and at the same time we've integrated our stormwater design into their project um and as a result uh, um, we're able to bring this funding in. We got funding from the EPA for uh, reduction of CSOs, $300,000 grant from the EPA on that. We're using state revolving loan fund money to accomplish our BMP installations on that. And um, there's a funding gap that's listed on the bottom of this slide of a million dollars that the Urban Arts Exchange has. And we, these slides here were prepared for a presentation to Longwood Foundation, and we just found out in the past several weeks that we got a $400,000 grant, so we're covering almost half of that gap with a grant funding from the Longwood Foundation, and it was one of the reasons why they were uh, encouraged to provide us that um, grant money was because of the integration of our um, project team to managing green infrastructure as well as incorporating it into the arts, so that's a um, an example on that. And I apologize if I went a little bit long, but the, um, uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to the moderator and we can take questions. Uh, one additional thing, I'll, I will just add a, a little flavor if there's any questions on it. Um, that land conservation loan um, fund uh, that was part of our funding source on there. The primary loan that got refinanced was for a cogeneration facility at our wastewater treatment plant that actually uses biogas to generate electricity and uses the heat from the generators to actually reduce the amount of sewer sludge that we have to dispose of by drying it out and evaporating the water out. And that was a guaranteed energy performance contract in which the contracting mechanism you know, had guarantees of how much savings the project would generate. So that was another unique financing mechanism that we used for that. And it was funded through state revolving loan fund money, but the contracting mechanism was that there was guaranteed energy savings as well. So it did have a component of some of the items that our other panelists had talked about on that project. So if there's any questions on that, I can also entertain those. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and stop talking and and turn it over to to the group. So, oh wait, how do I stop sharing here? Thank you so much, Brian. Um, 
really appreciate it. And I want to give a, a sincere thank you to all of our panelists, um, Ashley, Brian, and Jason. Really wonderful. Um, can't tell you how much we appreciate having you here this morning. Um, and so with that, I know that we've had some questions coming in through the chat. Um, and I am going to turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Danielle Swallow, to, uh, to share them with us. And um, for our panelists, please feel free. Some of them may be directed to, uh, at specific presentation items. Um, some of them may be a little bit more general. So um, Danielle, take it away. Thank you, Kate. Um, hi, I'm Danielle Swallow with Delaware Sea Grant, and we do have a couple of questions. And also want to make sure Brian sees all the chatter about Charlie's chips, because that actually got a lot of chatter in the chat box. Um, <laughs> but the first question um, probably goes to Jason um, in regards to the environmental impact bonds. Does the EIB label provide benefits in terms of the rate that's set for the issuer? Yeah, thanks. And I see a, a second question, which is related about the current EIB interest rates. Um, the so the environmental impact bond doesn't it it doesn't access a particular like standing you know governmental lending facility or anything like that. Like it'll tap your normal municipal bond investors, which would be attracted just because it's a municipal bond, right? And they invest all the time in, in municipal bonds just for purely financial, you know, percentage yield kind of reasons. But what it does is it brings an additional cohort of municipal bond investors who are actively hunting for municipal bond deals with environmental and social uh, impacts, and especially ones where they can quantify the impacts and then put on their, you know, like, uh, investment funds, annual sustainability report, you know, X amount of stormwater, X amount of pounds of nitrogen, X, you know, percent reduction in CSO events, things like that. And so the, the interest rate, uh, one, the, the EIB interest rate, it's, it's not something that we can promise because we're not the ones providing the capital. We're technical advisors who help access that additional cohort of ESG oriented investors. Um, but historically, EIBs have gotten better interest rates because of that extra investor demand. Um, and then so two, to answer your question, um, the, the interest rates will, will vary based on um, what your particular municipality's interest rate will be. Um, but historically, we have seen it to be uh, a little bit lower than your typical municipality's interest rate. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's another question. This is for Brian um, in relation to the, you know, the program you just uh, talked about. What kind of outreach to the public was needed, um, particularly to address pushback on the idea of a stormwater fee from your customer base? A lot of that outreach happened before I started with the city of about nine years ago. Um, but I you know they had they did a series of uh, outreach, so I think mainly through the council Matic districts, and and it was very much to communicate to the residents that this was about equity, and it, uh, and as well with the city council that this was not about generating additional revenue, but distributing our revenue more equ equitably amongst our our customer base. So there was quite a number of community meetings out there and as you can expect there was quite a bit of um uh pushback from the ones that were started getting bills that they hadn't historically received you know those parking lots were not very happy um we did discover that the cemeteries in the um in the city were sort of a unique category and we had to address them with some special agreements because uh they don't have <clears throat> especially the cemeteries in the city don't tend to have a, a, a significant source of income coming in, especially a lot of them that are fully built out. Um, so we had to deal with them, you know, in, in a, with a special set of agreements. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? And like I said, the, that outreach, I think, ended up resulting in this, uh, the consulting community in Wilmington seizing an opportunity to contact all of these uh, potential parcel owners and help them apply for appeals to it. So there was kind of a niche um, business for the consultants for a period of time as they applied for these, these appeals. I, if I could just add what, to Brian's great point. Um, we, so at the, at the beginning of our work in Delaware, 
we were engaged with the University of Delaware and the Nature Conservancy on a feasibility study around kind of all of these ideas that we've all talked about. And there, there were specific conversations around stormwater fees, which everybody kind of cringes around a stormwater fee, right? Ah, but the general consensus is actually pretty affirmative and, and positive around the notion of, I mean, there is political will out there when you wouldn't ex where you wouldn't expect it to be because of all the points that, that Brian made. Um, and we're actually w working with some municipalities on the Chesapeake side that are that are implementing stormwater fees for green infrastructure right now. It's right. Th this conversation has advanced demonstrably beyond where it was even five years ago in terms of the overall public concern around around water water quality and water management issues. Um, I can. I don't know if anyone's interested in reading that feasibility report, but if you are, follow up with me and I can give you a direct link to it. I'm sure. Uh, in terms of, does, does it discuss how um, that source of revenue does now present an access to financing and funding sources that maybe wouldn't have been there before that you have to maybe tap Absolutely. into a general fund bonds, uh, you know, for your municipality or governing body and, and by having a dedicated source of revenue to that it, it, it creates a opportunity for you to fund a longer term project absolutely um, with bond money and these financing it creates all sorts of additional flexibility and opportunity yeah it, it the feasibility study touches on that I, but yes that's great ashley and actually um another question just came in for you um, how could something like the Revolving Water Fund fit in with the work that Wilmington is doing? Well, that is a good question. We actually have talked to Brian about that. Um, so, it, it we would it, so if a if a municipality, for example, the city of Wilmington, were interested in further reducing the inflows to the CSO system by reducing um, water quality quantity that comes from, at this point, higher up in the watershed. So there, and or other green infrastructure within the watershed, but um, we could invest ahead of the city in identifying and creating pollution and qu water quality and quantity reductions from further up in the watershed um, that would feed into potentially the objectives of a, of a municipality that's lower in the watershed. So some of that stormwater fee revenue that might go toward financing a low interest SRF that perhaps has a green infrastructure sponsorship piece to it could then go to revolve back on the capital that we put in up front to create those reductions. Um, so that's actually a really nice way to close the loop if, uh, and hopefully that made sense. Yeah, so kind of sort of a tangible um, manifestation of that would be that uh, our CSO management, we have a little bit of a better success right now and achieving our goals of 85% capture by volume. However, we also have TMDLs for nitrogen and phosphorus and bacteria um, discharges to the river. And we're having a little more difficult time achieving those TMDL goals in our CSO management. And as you can imagine, in an urban environment that's densely populated, it's very expensive to implement some of those reduction policy projects. So it could very well be a really good um, you know, approach to, to take advantage of those reductions upstream in the watershed to help us achieve our TMDL reductions that we need um, in a much more cost-effective way um, and also benefit the watershed all the way down from the source down to the lower portion where we're at. And Brian, that was also part of why we just got a big award, award from Longwood. So, Right, the funders are looking at this also and, and looking at how all the pieces can come together to create these ecosystem-wide solutions and they, they're puzzles. 
they're, they're puzzles with many different pieces, but it's really exciting to see how some of them are coming together um, in Delaware in particular. Well, that's it for our questions. I'm going to turn this back over to Kate and um, invite everyone to be checking out the chat because there's some also very good comments that are being made and requests for more info. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Danielle. And thank you once again to Ashley and Brian and Jason. Um, we certainly appreciate your time and your presentations. Um, as was mentioned earlier, the presentations and the, the session recordings will be available. Uh, I know there's a lot of really um, dense and wonderful information that folks might want to revisit. So um, stay tuned, that will be coming. Um, also wanted to make sure that once again, we plugged the final two sessions of our uh, Rascal Summit this year. Um, from 3 to 4.30, we will have our local stories panel. Um, and then from 4.30 to 5, we'll have our Summit Lounge, which will be just a fun virtual networking event. Um, and we really hope that you're all able to join us for that as well. Um, so stay tuned. Um, you should be able to access the Zoom links. They will be different from this Zoom link uh, for this session. So um, make sure you're paying attention to which link you're clicking. Once again, I want to thank our sponsors for this event. They are really fantastic. Um, many of them have been with us for several years now, and we're so grateful for their support. And then last but certainly not least, I want to thank all of you for attending. We are so grateful to have you here with us um, in these uh, strange virtual times, um, but so glad that we could get together again this year. We look forward to seeing you um, at the sessions later on today. And um, with that, I will, uh, I will let us all go. So thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, all.